So the passage I, I just read, most everybody has heard it at some point in time. Um, love is patient, love is kind, love is everything that we just talked about. Most of us have heard and have talked about in our debatings, but we don't always deal with it within the context that it was presented. Uh, for example, a lot of times you'll hear this used at weddings. Uh, the minister, the preacher, whoever's doing the ceremony will read, uh, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others. To describe the love that a husband and wife are supposed to have for one another. Problem is, this passage had nothing to do with what a husband and wife are supposed to have for one another. Now, I can kind of defend this because ideally, the love that a husband and wife or a, or a romantic love should have these characteristics. So, but in terms of doing an actual study and understanding what the passage is about, if you want to understand what they're talking about here, this is not about marriage. By any stretch of the imagination, it has nothing to do with romantic love. It has nothing to do with brotherly love or philos love. There's, to properly understand this, and this is a study, so we want to understand what Paul is actually talking about here. There's two critical Bible study points that you have to consider when you're looking at this passage. First thing to remember is that the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. The, you know, we, we're looking at this 13th chapter as a new chapter, but it wasn't written that way. They didn't sit and do verse 1, verse 2, verse 2, verse 3, chapter 1, chapter 2. They didn't outline their stuff. They just wrote a letter. All this stuff runs together, and so where we put chapter markers may not have been necessarily where they would have started a new thought if they were even writing in paragraphs at the time. The second thing is, that, and this is a lot more familiar with people, is that in studying any passage of scripture, it's important to understand the verses that precede the passage in question. So we're looking at the 13th chapter, and you, can, you start with verse 1, and it says, if I speak in with tons of men or of angels but don't have love, I'm a resounding gog. And the people who arrange the Bible in, in the, a more easily readable format see this and they're talking about love and so they're going to put a 13th chapter mark there. But this is actually a continuation of the discussion that he was having in the 12th chapter. And the reason we know that it was a continuation of what he was having discussing in the 12th chapter is because it's introduced in the 31st verse of the 12th chapter. It says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. So with this conversation here in the 13th chapter is a continuation of what he was doing within the 12th chapter. We talked about that in the last lesson, just briefly to bring the, everything back to mind. The 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians discusses the question of which spiritual gift, and in this case it's talking about skills. We've talked about the fact that in Ephesians it's talking about the people as gifts, in Corinthians we're talking about skills, uh, healing, prophecy tasks. Which gift is the greatest in Christianity? Which gift should people, is of God or the Spirit of God? Which one should people want the most? Paul writes to them in the 12th chapter and tells them that all spiritual skills are of one Holy Spirit and all have equal value. Teaches that the gifts that exist among the community of believers exist to benefit the body and work together in a complementary manner to edify the members of the body. So whatever gifts you got, it exists to edify, not yourself, but to edify and be a blessing to somebody else. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. This chapter closes with two verses that introduce the 13th chapter. So the 12th chapter is all a, a, a diatribe on the importance of all gifts, equally important to, to edify one another. And then we get to the bottom of the 12th chapter. And he transitions into the 13th chapter with, a, uh, with the 31st verse. Now eagerly desire the greatest gifts. Paul instructs Corinthians that they should seek or desire or develop the best or most useful advantage gifts, but offers to show them a more excellent way. Then we get into the 13th chapter talking about love. So one... Once again, putting this into context, we're not talking about relationships and dating and, and mother-loving fathers or, or you know, familial love or brother. 
there's a specific context that this is talking about. We're talking about a spiritual phenomenon that is love. And he calls it a more excellent way. The more excellent way is love. He doesn't say a feeling. He doesn't say the more excellent emotion. He says the more excellent way, which the, the Greek word that he's using there is hodos, a path or a journey or a road. This is a discipline that we're talking about, not a set of feelings that come and go, not a bunch of warm fuzzies that you get because you think somebody is super cute and they think that you're cute. But we are talking about a path and a discipline, a way of lifestyle. The way is called love, which means that in spite of emotions, because we're not dealing with an emotion here, we're dealing with the discipline. A per in spite of an emotion, a believer can and should be walking in the path of love. The talk about I mean, thus, let me not get ahead of myself, thus in all of the spiritual skills that a person should desire, and he goes on being apostle, being a prophet, being a healing, or healer, teaching, uh, speaking in tongues, he goes over all of these gifts in the 12th chapter. But the thing, in all of the spiritual gifts that people desire and hold in high esteem, Paul offers to show them a pursuit that ought to be esteemed more highly or above any of them because it is more excellent, advantageous, or useful than any of the gifts that he mentions in his writing. There are prophecy schools and churches and training programs. I have seen pastoral counseling schools, their school for ministry and evangelism. We've got an entire discipline known as homiletics devoted to properly preparing sermons. We've got new members classes, new converts classes, choir rehearsals, usher training seminars, musicians rehearsals. There's seminaries and great schools of theology. But one thing that I have never actually heard of is any church or any school, theological school, that puts on a class about love from a spiritual standpoint. That's not to say it doesn't exist. Maybe that there, that's a course in a seminary that I've never heard of, but within common parlance and within common church and spiritual operation, you don't really hear much about love as a class. We've got, and what Paul is saying is that all these other gifts, they're great and they exist to bless each and every, each and every member of the body, but there's something a little bit more important that you should be pursuing. How much of our time and how much of our discourse is actually spent talking about it though? and studying it and understanding what it means. Generally speaking, we're too busy having praise parties to get into that. According to Paul, without love, speaking in various languages, even angelic languages, becomes unintelligible and unintelligible shrill noise. Prophecy, divine insight, and knowledge, even with even great faith, lose all substance without love. Without this gift, great acts of generosity and devotion become devoid of meaning. Essentially what Paul teaches is that none of these spiritual gifts have any meaning, substance, or effectiveness without love. Consequently, if a spiritual community's health is a function of its diversity, as asserted in the 12th chapter, then it is even more contingent upon the love of that community. A healthy church, once again, is a loving church. That's how important this is. Paul says that nothing else that you do really matters if it does not come from love. Now, what exactly is this? What, are, what is it that we're talking about? That is a much more, that is a much deeper question than anybody is really qualified to answer. And I get into some of the reasons why in just a second. It's difficult to give a precise definition of love in any sense in any sense, whether we're talking about romantic, brotherly, or familial. Love is complicated no matter what. Everybody experiences it differently. Everybody feels it differently. Cultural factors come into play. It's just an extraordinarily complicated subject matter from a secular standpoint. The love that is described by Paul to the Corinthians here is specified by the Koine Greek term agape, which literally means goodwill, love, or benevolence, or affection. However, this is a starting place for the meaning. This is what the term meant in common, common parlance at that time. But the scope of the word in theological terminology becomes much more complex as it is presented in Scripture as the definitive attribute of God. In John, the first chapter, the 
or in First John, the fourth chapter and the eighth verse, he says that God is agape. God is love. If you study it out and you go through and you look at all of the God is statements that are in the Bible, it's very rare, and I don't think I saw any, where it will definitively make a statement, God is a noun. God is, this is what God is. Usually they will give an adjective. God is merciful. It's a description or a modifier based on how he's acting or operating. But to say that God is a specific thing is a very, very powerful statement both from a cultural and from a theological perspective, saying God is love means that this becomes inextricably linked to the definite concrete definition of God's existence, which is a mouthful of a statement. This confers a transcendent quality upon love. For if God is love and the fullness of God is beyond the confines of human language or comprehension, so too must the exactitude of love transcend the limitations of humanity. In other words, if God is too big for any of us to fully understand, if God is too big for any of us to fully be able to describe in language and words, if he's bigger than all of that, then if God is love, then agape, from a theological standpoint, what Paul is referencing here and what we're talking about, is bigger than what we can confine with the limitations of our language it gets much more complicated because if it is God, if it is the, an essential part of God, then all of a sudden it also takes on the co-eternality and the omniscience and omnipresence and it, it, it is linked to God in a way that you makes it impossible to give a concrete, very specific, narrowly construed definition. The minute you try to put it into words, just like the minute you try to explain who God is, you're gonna, your language is going to end up leaving you short the minute you try to put into words the exact specifics of love, of agape, you'll mess it up. Now, just as a side note, you will hear a lot of people use the, when they're talking about it, they will say agape love. When they're talking about God's love, God's, his agape love. That is not a grammatically correct use of that term. That would be the equivalent of saying love, love. They're, they're trying to use the term agape to describe a type of love, not. But the problem is that it is a noun in and of itself. So it would be as opposed. They treat it like if a shirt is red, it's a red shirt. Red modifies, describes the type of shirt. But you can't use that word that way. That's not what it is. It's not an adjective. Agape, if you're going to use it properly, is its own entity and its own identity. It's not a modifier of something else. It exists by itself. So anytime somebody says agape love, they're being redundant okay. because they're saying love, love, which it's, it's a minor technicality. Nobody else probably cares. I don't even know that I care except for to govern the way that I write and the way that I speak. It doesn't really matter. It's just one of those little trivial things because I got issues that I felt like it was necessary to stop and bring to your attention. Just so you know when you hear it. So agape, the, the love that Paul is talking about in this chapter, the spiritual gift, the love that makes everything work, has become, con become understood in a general sense as the eternally divine love. In other words, it is an in intransitive relational attribute of God, which existed before creation within the Godhead, and is afforded to humanity as the image of God, as well as the love that man develops for God in a relationship with him. Let me back that up and break that down a little bit. It is the intransitive relational attribute of God. In other words, it's, not some, it's something that existed before there was anything else. Mm -hmm. Just as eternal as God is, and God existed before any creation. In the beginning was God, Genesis 1 and 1. Or in the beginning, God created Okay, in, in the beginning, God created. God existed before any of creation. Well, just what existed with God before creation, that's not a theologically perfect way of saying it, but you'll get the idea. In the beginning was God's love. God loved before there was anything else in creation. It was, it's not his, his righteousness or his holiness, for example, is a response or it's a contrast between creation and his essence. Righteousness and holiness exist in contrast. If there was nothing else but God, righteousness would have no meaning. 
Righteousness has meaning because there is a contrast between creation and the nature of God. On the other hand, love exists independent of creation. Agape exists because God exists. Mm -hmm. So that it is an intransitive relational attribute of God, which existed before creation within the Godhead which has been afforded to humanity as the image of God. The reason that we can experience agape is because we are created in the image of God. And part of that, in that, that is a very, there are theological books written on what being in the image of God is, but it, it allows us to experience, actually being created in his image allows us to experience and be participants in that if we so choose as well as the love that man develops for God in relationship with him. So we've got God, God's love in existence before creation, his love with relation to man, and man's love in, in relation to God as he begins to walk with God and walk in relationship with God. That's agape. Nothing to do with marriage. Once again, we'll go back to that because we keep we put it in there. I get it. I just want you to understand that when you have your conversations about what love is supposed to look like between your boyfriends and girlfriends or your significant others, if you want to use this, understand, okay, it, maybe it has some commonalities, but it's not a perfect mold because that's not what he was talking about. Moving on. This love, while transcendent, what, even though it's, this is actually bigger than any of us can actually put into words, it is tangible, transformative, and transmittable. Agape can be perceived as tangible, can be felt in the incarnation, ministry, and passion of Christ through the narrative of scripture, through encounters with the spirit or energies of God, or most importantly, through the people who claim communion with God, also known as Christians. We can't put it into the words, but you, can ex you should be able to experience and feel at shades of it and parts of it when you interact and relate with Christians. It is a terrible indictment on the Christian culture and community at large that more people don't understand God is a loving God. If, if that's not at the top of the list of what people characterize God as, God is, there's something very wrong with the theology, doctrine, and culture of your walk with God alone or the, the theology of the community that you're a part of. That should be the, at the utmost, or in the form, forefront of anyone's mind in understanding who God is when they relate with Christians is that God is a loving God. The problem there is a disconnect probably because we don't spend enough time talking about it. I'm not going to backtrack on that though. Yet this fact, the fact that most people, that it's, it's not easily seen and recognizable is not beyond a measure of understanding. Agape doesn't come natural to people. This doesn't happen by accident or you just trip and fall into it. Agape does not come natural as it is divine essence and thus is outside of the human experience. To be able to love the way that God loves is not something that any of us ever experience anywhere else. Not the fullness of it, not, it, not in its perfect state. It's so it's natural that it doesn't come, come normal to people and we wrestle and struggle with it. No person can express it perfectly because no, perfect, no person will understand it in its entirety while they are in their mortality. It's something that is cultivated through relationship with God as one develops a more clear understanding of the person of God. This relationship and revelation ought to cause transformation in believers reflective of their experience while enabling them to transmit this love to the degree that they understand it. In other words, we feel it, we commune with it, it changes us, and we should be able to carry it to transmit it to someone else. A lack of such transformation is in indicative of either a defective relationship or defective revelation. Those who successfully undergo this process of transformation, however, will continue to do so for the remainder of their lives. In every stage and in every change they experience, they'll be able to, they will be enabled to transmit, confer, or communicate that love to the people that they interact with on a daily basis. Thus, agape is a gift available to every believer through their walk with Christ, which gives substance to all other skills and allows them to edify the other members of the body. So, 
we interact with God, we relate with him, we have experiences, and we experience his love, it changes us. That much you can understand from being able to relate with somebody. When you find a healthy relationship in a world of unhealthy relationships, when you find people that will legitimately appreciate who you are in a world where people are oftentimes out to get what they can get out of you, it can be very powerful, it can greatly affect a person, and it is generally transformative. You, you, you see it and you start to think, maybe there's other people out there like this, and why is it so hard to find them? It opens your eyes. It makes you start to see things differently when you have relationships that are genuine, that are real. Like I said, especially when you're dealing with a society where that is so hard to come by. Interacting with people causes you to change. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. When you're dealing with a good, healthy relationship, causes changes for the better. Well, think of the, the magnitude of the transformation that happens as you relate with God and he shows himself to you is beyond description. It's not something that you can, but interacting with him causes you to change. Understanding his love, understanding who he is causes you to change. And as it be, be, because it's so powerful and so it permeates so deeply into the core of who you are and you, causes you to see the world differently, causes you to understand yourself differently, and then you carry that understanding out, and hopefully you interact with people in a way that is consistent with that, so that way they can experience, at the very least, what you've experienced. Said all that to get back to the book of Corinthians. Returning to the book of Corinthians, Paul teaches that without agape, no other gift has meaning. Spiritual gifts that are exercised with or fueled by agape are executed with a relational priority. The imprint of God's relatable essence is found in every manifestation of such a spiritual power. So when the power of God, and we talk a lot about the power of God, when the power of God or the love of God, when agape is what fuels the administration of a, of a gift, a skill, a talent, you the fingerprints of God are can be seen all over it. They can, it can be felt and experienced. And it, it's God's love that is the sustaining aspect of the relationship that we have with him that fuels us, drives us, nurtures us, and causes us to grow. The intent, when it's driven by, when it's driven by agape, the intent is solely to edify the other members of the spiritual community. This means that everyone's gift and everyone's ministry becomes an exercise in transmitting God's love to one another. And through that love, the members of the body are nourished and strengthened. So we're getting back to the metaphor of the body of Christ, which is what we've been dealing with in terms of healthy spiritual communities. Within the body, every member is, in, within a secular body, natural body, biological entity, the members of the body are interlinked and interconnected. When you link all of those together, they share with each other. They, they, their capabilities, whatever, whether it's a blood cell, or it's bone marrow, or it's a brain cell, if it's a, a dendrite or a neuron, they all exist and they all produce something that is used to nurture and develop everything else. Mm -hmm. So by each person using their skills and using their talents, they nurture the other members of the body and they're strengthened and, and, and nourished. Exercising gifts for the sake of exercising gifts is an exercise in vanity. There are musicians who play their instruments simply because they love music or love to play their instrument. There are singers who sing because they love singing. There are preachers who will preach because they love to talk. Paul says that the, the utilization of these gifts is not motivated by agape for God and for humanity, then it is an exercise of infutility. The purpose of playing, singing, preaching, teaching, prophecy, working miracles, great faith, even self-sacrifice, must be to lovingly commune with God and benefit others if it is to have substance. So, yeah, I can get up and I can sit and I can play because I enjoy music. But when my, if it is a gift that is supposed to be fueled by God's spirit, the objective shouldn't be for me to just feel good about playing and have a good time playing. It's supposed to be to minister to everybody else in some way. It's supposed to be to be able to break chains, to be able to elevate people to be in a position that they can experience God, to be able to do all of those things that we talk about, that has to be the objective, not just I want to play because I want to play. 
And so if somebody else who's more skilled and more capable comes in and playing, you take a back seat and let them do what they want to do because your main interest is not just sitting there playing. Your main interest is in seeing the body edify. I don't just get up and talk to preach because I like to hear myself talk. And if there's somebody who can do what I'm trying to do better and they come in, I can take a back seat. This is where John said, I must decrease and he must increase. When Christ comes on the scene, John's got his ministry, John's up and doing what he's doing, and he's preaching baptism, and then Christ comes on the scene, John says, it's time for me to take a back seat because Christ's ministry has to be to move forward. That's understanding, one, who Christ was, but more importantly, understanding, or just as importantly, understanding that in order for this to move forward, in order for the work of God to move forward, Christ is in a much better position to do this than I am. And so I got to take a back seat because my main interest is in doing is doing the will of God and being a blessing to his people. And if the best way for me to be a blessing to the people is to sit back and not do anything, that's what I do. That's a ministry that is fueled by a godly love. Paul presents a list of characteristics of agape to paint a portrait of what it looks like. like this is very familiar to many of us. Love is patient, is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, is not proud does not dishonor others, is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Very familiar. Much of this list, I'm not going to go through every last one of these aspects, much of it can be understood by experience. But there's two of these traits that I want to hone in on because they're often overlooked. Love does not dishonor others. Recall from the previous lessons that the concept of honor centered, centered around a person's claim of value and the public affirmation of that value to society or to collective, the collective. Love does not allow for anyone else to be seen as less valuable. To walk in love is to try to recognize the inherent value of everyone, both friend and enemy. This is a supernatural gift that flows from relating with God. This don't come easy. It doesn't come natural. One of the transformations that ought to take place in a believer that walks with God is that they learn to see other people the way that God sees them. That is something that challenges you because you want to see people based on the way they treat you. You want to see people based on the way society sees them. To be able to look at an individual the way that God looks at them takes a lot of doing. It's something that only comes through God enabling a person to be able to do so and for them communing and relating with him. This is how Christians are supposed to love everybody. It's got nothing to do with emotions to towards to total strangers. No, you are not going to feel as affectionate towards somebody that walks in off the street as you would towards somebody that you've been relating with for 30 years. That's not what loving everybody means. What it means to love everybody is to treat, to see them and to treat them, both from the greatest to the least, as though they are valuable because God sees them as valuable. Let, if I love everybody, then I learn to see everyone through agape through God's love towards humanity and towards people. And regardless of what they look like, regardless of what they smell like, regardless of how they talk to you, regardless of what they treat you, how they treat you, and sometimes you have to withdraw yourself from the person because they're hostile and aggressive and abusive and you have to break fellowship with them. But in spite of those things that you have to do, you still look at that person and try to see them the way that God sees them, with the value that God has established for them simply in their own individuality. They are not valuable because of what they contribute to the group. They are valuable as a unique and diverse person. Spiritually abusive communities fail miserably in this respect because they express their version of love on the basis of how the person can help the group instead of recognizing through agape the inherent value of a person independent of the group. So they're real big on you if you can sing. They're real big on you if you can play. They're real big on you if you got money. If you don't have any of those things, then we'll catch up with you and we can catch up with you and we'll pray for you and God bless you. But the value system is backwards, almost. Or not even backwards. That's, it's just disconnected from godly value, a godly value system. This, which leads us to the other attribute of love that's not, or that is commonly overlooked. 
Love is not self-seeking. Agape does not have its own agenda. Walking in agape is not done with expectations of reciprocity or reward from the people with whom it is shared. There are forms of love that need to be returned, such as brotherly love or romantic love. There, there are love versions of love where it's entirely based on the relationship. It develops from out of those the relationship. I develop a romantic love with somebody from relating with them and it grows from out of that and it needs to be reciprocated in order to be maintained. That's the expectation. What we're talking about here is a romantic love though. It's agape. It's godly love. Other forms of love exist predicated on a dynamic interpersonal relationship. However, agape exists simply because it is. It ex its existence is ex inextricably locked in the eternal mystery of God. So whereas these other forms of love need something else, need to be fueled by a, common, a similar response from other people, God's love exists just because it does. Mm -hmm. And so when expressing that, it's not about trying to, it's not about looking for them to do something back. It's not about hoping to get something out of it. You express it because it's in you and it's there and you just do it. It, it just is. Agape does not seek personal gain. Christians do not share love or walk in love, or Christians do not share love or walk in love in hopes that it gains them friendships, popularity, or notoriety. Christians share love in hopes that the person with whom it is shared can experience and feel agape. The hope is that the person can understand that there is a God who loves them as they are in their individuality. The hope is that the person may choose to relate with this loving God and walk in discipleship. This hope does not exist because the believer is looking to, to earn brownie points with God, pastor, saints, or friends, but because they know the other person will be better for it. Should the person choose not to, at that time, be, relate with God, they ought not be cast aside in frustration or disappointment because God still sees them as valuable. So in other words, the hope that, I, that you have, love has not, doesn't have its own agenda. I'm not looking, I don't have an agenda aside from letting you see what it looks like. I want you to see and experience what I understand is God's love. I want you to know that God sees you, understands you, and values you. What you choose to do with that from that point on, I'm going to sit back and sip my iced tea because that's not my business. That's between you and God. But when you interact with me and you deal with me, or when somebody interacts with you and deals with you, agape love simply looks to be to show itself and let somebody. I, see, I just did it. I said agape love. Wish I could edit that out. Agape looks to show itself in order to allow a person to make a choice on what they want to relate with. Fulfilling one's ambitions, passions. Dreams, fantasies, quest for significance, or delusion of grandeur cannot motivate the work of God. When it does, those are the imprints that exist, and there is nothing to sustain or strengthen believers, as opposed to a work that's fueled by agape, which has no agenda, which doesn't allow other people to be dishonored. When it's fueled by me wanting to be something, that's just as recognizable as the love of God is. And it leaves people with nothing to sustain themselves, nothing to grow on, nothing to be fed off of. It has a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof, resulting in overfed but undernourished believers. As discussed in previous lessons, those undernourished believers begin to seek to cannibalize fresh meat, or new converts, for their sustenance. They can possess every gift listed in the Bible, and some not listed in there, and yet be starving if there is little agape amongst them. Thus one must say that a healthy church is a loving church, and any church that is not loving is not healthy. As we wrap this thing up, love is a symbol of discipleship. I've got a few verses here. John 13, 34 and 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. This is Christ speaking. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. 1 John 3, 10 and 11. So now we can tell 
who are the children of God and who are the children of God of the devil anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God <clears throat> this is the message you have heard from the beginning we should love one another first John 4 and 8 but anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love these are the words that Christ spoke to his disciples and that John communicated to the believers under his apostleship Note that Christ does not say that people will know his disciples by the miracles they perform, by the clothes that they will wear, by the wealth that they will accumulate, or even by how flawlessly they live their lives. Instead, Christ gives a very single, or, or gives a single and revolutionary distinguishing attribute for his disciples. You'll know them by the love that they have. It doesn't not by how many miracles I perform, not by how many people shout when I preach, not by how good of a musician I am, not by how good I am at keeping the books, and not because I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't, and I abstain from this. Christ says that his disciples are known by their love. In every passage viewed thus far, Corinthians, Romans, and Ephesians, where Paul uses the metaphor of the body of Christ, he qualifies his comments by saying that members that the members operate in love and to a loving end. Up to this point, the discussion has been on the attributes of a healthy church, yet every individual is the church. Thus, the discussion is not only a litmus test for the health of the community, but also the health and the maturity of each individual believer. In other words, we've been talking a lot about what a community is supposed to look like, what the church is supposed to look like, what scripture says a healthy church is supposed to be well we're the church if it's it the church isn't the building and we know we understand that but it's very easy to look at what they should be and not realize that we're also talking about what i should be or what you should be these attributes these characteristics ought to be what drive who we are and what we do that we should be above all all other people a loving people if we are walking in a healthy and fruitful, productive relationship with God. In a healthy spiritual community, the members walk in agape, and it is agape that allows their spiritual skills as well as their interpersonal relationships to edify one another and draw outsiders to experience and participate in this love. So that is... That, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a healthy church should be a loving church. We commune with God. We see other people the way that God sees them. We esteem them to be every bit as important as we understand ourselves to be. We see their needs as important as our needs are because we understand that we won't be, that th their health and their well-being is a blessing to me. That my well-being is a blessing to them. We interact with each other. It, all of the preaching, all the teaching, all the prophesying, all of the shouting, all of the, all of the uh, trappings of a religious establishment, even driven by, let's say, that the anointing is real. None of it means anything if it's not done out of a desire to be a blessing to other people. And in return, I get what I need because other people are like-minded. So I'm not just constantly giving, but I'm being sown into. It's a reciprocal relationship. The community, th this is why you need a community, because you give out, you show love, you have love, show, love shown to you that feeds you and that fuels you. And it makes for a stronger group. Nothing else that we've talked about matters or works if God's love is not what drives us. Our, our love, our agape towards God, the love that we've developed in relationship with him, and the love that we share, and the love that God has for humanity. We try to take that on. We'll never get it entirely. We'll never be in, perfectly be able to see other people the way God does, because God doesn't have the issues that we do. God, he handles people's humanity a lot better than we do a lot of times. But in as much as we have developed and as much as we've, as we've grown to be able to do so, we want to be able to look at people the way that God looks at them and to be able to minister to them the way that Christ would minister to them if he were there to be able to do so. 
So that is the lesson. I hope it was a blessing to those of you who watched. I hope you all are at home and comfortable and relaxing. Um, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll have this up and available to be to watch at any time or to your convenience if you want to go back over and listen to any of it. And we'll probably leave room for people to be able to talk and ask questions and give feedback when we start back up on the 15th. So stay safe, stay warm. Hope you attend. Hope that you enjoy the Super Bowl and the commercials and the halftime show, and I will see you later. Good night.